Will Ryan returns to the show. He is the CEO of Granite Shares. We'll be talking about his outlook for tech and some of the disruptors in the tech industry. Welcome back to the show, Will. Thanks, David. Thank you for having me. Always great to be back on the show. Always good to see you. I think the biggest concern for a lot of investors is whether or not this momentum in tech can be sustained. As you know, the tech sector has been leading the pack of the S&P 500, pulling out the entire market. In fact, it's really just been a few major names in the Magnificent Seven, kind of like last year. We'll talk about that. Uh, what is your general outlook on the tech sector? Do you think it's run up too much, too far? It's gone up too much and uh, it's time for a pullback? I don't think so. Um, that's not to say that we can't have a pullback, but I think that, um, you know, so far, this has been a move that's been driven by earnings outperformance. And that's what we've seen from the large tech companies, you know, particularly Nvidia, obviously leading the pack, but, um, you know, the performance so far really has been driven by strong fundamentals. The majority of tech companies really beating on earnings. And I think it's a continuation of the trend that we saw you know, before 2022, um, which was tech dominance or large cap tech dominance when we were talking about fan companies instead of the Magnificent Seven, but that these companies are again, you know, leading the market higher. The risk is, uh, Will, is that the rest of the market seems to be disconnected from tech. And in, other, in other words, it looks like the rest of the market and in most sectors, eight of the 10 sectors have been trailing down since the beginning of June. And so some speculate that this is the beginning of the end of the bull rally. And it's only a matter of time before tech follows the rest of the economy. First of all, do you agree with that? And I guess a follow-up question would be, um, is there enough of a difference fundamentally between tech and tech earnings and the rest of the stock markets to justify this bifurcation? There are a number of points there. I think, um, you know, first of all, I think let's distinguish again between the performance of the large tech companies and the broader market. You know, this is what we saw again a few years ago before the interest rate environment kind of repriced all companies in the market, um, where we were talking about the performance of the S&P 500 and other large cap indices, again, being driven by a small number of large tech companies. And I think at that time, you know, that there was a view that, you know, again, this is driven by, you know, fundamentals, but we were also in an environment of, you know, ultra low interest rates and the market was awash with liquidity. You know, this time around, that's not the situation that we're in. Clearly, interest rate environment has changed. And what we've learned from that is that actually, with the exception of 2022, when all companies went through a repricing, the, the large tech companies seem to be largely immune from the effects of higher interest rates. Now, that's not the same as all of the other companies or the majority of other companies in the market, and particularly you know, as you go down the market cap scale to the smaller companies. And it's one of the main reasons, if not the main reason, I think that indices such as the Russell 2000 or the smaller companies index, you know, have not managed to deliver performance this year. And that's largely because, you know, interest rates affect those companies way more than they do the large tech companies. So I think that kind of explains where we are and the difference that we have. And if anything, I think, David, um, on the inflation side, numbers still show that inflation is coming down, hence why we've got the market rallying again today. But I think if interest rates do start to come down, that actually benefits the, the smaller companies. Again, I think it's neutral for the large tech companies, um, but clearly from an absolute you know, mathematical valuation perspective, it's positive. Um, so I think that's when we start to see a broadening out, um, you know, leaving aside every, any sort of bad news that may happen in between. Okay, let's talk about admit NVIDIA now, the clear market leader. It briefly surpassed all of the companies to become the world's largest and most valuable company by market cap. Some even speculate it's on track to hit $10 trillion. Of course, there are hurdles, right? Other competitors stepping into the fray. Uh, what's next for NVIDIA, you think? What are the major developments for the company that investors need to be paying attention to right now? Well, obviously, the, the, the first thing is, I know we're a little bit away from it, but we've got the next earnings coming up at the end of August. So although the, the the, the new or the latest earnings cycle is just kicking off now. Um, NVIDIA typically comes towards the end of the pack, so the end of August for that. Yeah, people will be looking at the earnings. You know, Can they keep on delivering um, the outperformance that, that are shown? And again, I feel like um, we've heard a lot of this you know, coming from other companies, whereby the amount of money that um, certainly the mega cap tech companies are spending 
on AI to the benefit of companies like NVIDIA shows no sign of slowing down. So I think the fact that um, NVIDIA surpassed Microsoft and Apple, you know, they've become the most valuable company in the world, uh, albeit briefly, we were expected, you know, the, a bit of a, you know, a blow off top um, after that event. But, you know, really, this is, to me, um, something that has a lot of legs to go in it. You know, you, you, you got to take a step back and sometimes and think, you know, a company like NVIDIA be worth more in five years than it will be today. I think if the answer to that is yes, then um, we think that that will be significant, whether it's $10 trillion or, or not. Um, I think it's safe to say that with the growth in AI, that there's more growth to go. What is the most significant, I think, in your opinion, product release from NVIDIA so far this year? I think it's the new, the new chips that they came out with. Blackwell. Um, and yes, exactly. Um, but, I, but I think, again, it's important to note that the demand for the existing chips is also really strong. And, you know, pricing power still remains, you know, incredibly, incredibly positive. And the company just seems to be years ahead of, you know, kind of closest competitors within the space for now. And again, it doesn't mean to say that, you know, people won't try and play catch up with the nature of competitive markets, but it just feels, and certainly by looking at the numbers, that, you know, we got a long way to go. Uh, you have both 2x long NVIDIA and 2x short NVIDIA ETFs. I wonder if you've noticed a difference in volume? Massively so. So our, our 2x long, David, has become one of the most highly traded stocks in the world. Um, so that's NVDL is the ticker. Yep. So this trades more than stocks like um, Berkshire Hathaway, JP Morgan, ExxonMobil. Um, so really kind of an incredible, uh, you know, statistic when you think about how much, um, this thing is trading. And that really is indicative of, you know, the, the sort of NVIDIA, you know, zeitgeist, if you will, at the moment and has become a global phenomenon. NVD, which is the 2X short, also trades a lot, you know, in terms of in absolute terms, but it's nothing compared to the long. So. What that tells you is that investors are overwhelmingly biased towards the long side of NVIDIA and preparing to buy dips sort of aggressively. There's still demand for the short side. And definitely when we, when we get closer to earnings, I'm sure we'll see, you know, more interest in that, but it's overwhelmed by the, the long interest in NVDL at the moment. I've heard this counter argument about uh, the chip sex sector, uh, generally speaking. It, they, I, I've heard comparisons to Cisco. I've co heard comparisons to uh, uh, the internet companies, the dot com mania. I've heard comparisons to um, uh, to utility companies. You know, all sorts of comparisons were thrown out there to to make the case as to why uh, this time is like the same as before, the bubbles that we've seen in the past. Can you make the case as to why this time is different? Well, if, if you, it depends on what you're kind of comparing it to. But clearly, if we go back to you know the dot com bubble, you know a lot of those stocks were valued in very different ways to the way that stocks are valued today. So. Based upon you know how many visits you know a company got to its website, et cetera, is very very different from the way that um, stocks are, are valued, especially in a you know five percent interest rate environment. So fundamental earnings driven is totally different. Uh, the only thing that is different is that Nvidia has risen um, as a company you know so quickly to the kind of top of the pack. But we've had Microsoft you know top of the pop for a long long time. We've had Apple. Um, as well in these sort of, you know, maintaining position of mega cap stock, most valuable, you know, company in the world. And you don't really hear too many people calling for a bubble in those stocks. And the fact that I think that a lot of people are top calling NVIDIA, um, is actually kind of positive news in that, you know, if everybody was saying that NVIDIA was going to 10 trillion and it was completely unstoppable and could never go down, then I think we'd have cause for, for major concern. But if anything, um, I think that, that you get more commentary around, you know, NVIDIA has gone up too far. Can it continue? Is it a bubble, et cetera, which I think is actually healthy for the stock. What indicators would point to you that perhaps the top is in for a stock like NVIDIA? I think when when it starts to break down, um, again, whether it's, you know, breaking a particular moving average or when, you know, it has a down day and other chip stocks are up, you know, other stocks in the sector are up. But ultimately, like I said, David, I come back to the first point, which is that this is driven by earnings and earnings expectations. And so 
you know, when we come to the next earnings release at the end of August, clearly if it doesn't meet expectations, and it's not just about that number, but it will be about the guidance, you know, the, the future of the company, then we can start talking about, you know, the change if that was, if that were to happen. Um, are insider sales a concern for you at all? So this came in from uh, uh, the SEC filings. June 13th, Jensen Huang, CEO, filed notice to sell 120,000 shares worth roughly $15.5 million at the time. He's not the only executive selling. I mean, people sell for all sorts of reasons, but uh, are you looking at this as a sell signal? Uh, definitely not. I mean, typically these things are, are very sort of operational based and sort of on a predetermined plan, um, sort of irrespective of, you know what's happening with the stock. So yeah, to, to me, it's it's noise. Uh, I like to talk about DRUP, D R U P, which is another ETF you have in your yeah. portfolio. It's um, the Granite Shares Nasdaq Select Disruptors ETF. It seeks to. I'm just reading the fact sheet here. It seeks to track the performance before fees of the Nasdaq U.S. Large Cap Select Disruptors Index. Tell us what's in this index, uh, Will, and basically the philosophy behind why this particular fund exists. So this is a, an ETF, diversified ETF, so not a, a leveraged single stock ETF, um, but this is an ETF that has a basket or covers a basket of 50, 50 stocks. So those are the top 50 um, disruptive technology names in the US market, and those are measured by NASDAQ, which calculates the index. So this is a NASDAQ-designed index that's designed to capture disruption, and we're talking about the top 50 companies in the market. So what's interesting about this strategy is that it's you know rules based. It looks at seven um, fundamental screens or factors um, and weights those accordingly. So those are things like patent value, the R and D expenses, revenue growth, etc. And you weight those, give them a score, and ultimately you get to uh, top fifty uh, group of companies. But I think one of the most interesting things is this fund has performed really well, but it's performed really well without four of the Magnificent Seven. So it does not own NVIDIA, does not own Tesla, does not own Apple, um, and does not own Amazon. And so that's a kind of really interesting thing because a lot of the innovation strategies in the market um, are really just Magnificent Seven funds sort of in disguise. And so this is a very different strategy that looks for you know, specific fundamentals around what makes a disruptive company um, therefore, you know, innovation, investing um, to a thesis, and this is what you end up with. Year to date, it's outperformed the S&P 500. The DROP is up 18.3% as of July 2nd. The S&P 500 is up 16%. So it closely tracks the broad index, uh, slight outperformance year to date, like I mentioned. Um, I, I know you've... You, you, you're tracking an index, but I, w w if someone were to say to you, well, these these are legacy companies, they're not really disruptors anymore, how would you respond to that criticism? I'm looking at the top fund holdings, like you mentioned, Microsoft, Meta Platforms, Alphabet, uh, Broadcom, Johnson & Johnson, Salesforce, Qualcomm. I mean, these are blue chip, large tech names. Um, one could argue there are more disruptive companies out there. I think, I think people can always argue that, but this is data driven. So Again, what, what, what somebody views as disruptive company, um, is clearly going to be different from another, you know, in the sort of philosophical sense. Yeah. But this is very much sort of a quantitative, you know, screen whereby it's six fundamental factors and those factors computed together, you know, are the score. And we take the top 50 names that have the highest scores. So you're going to see some names in there that, you know, you might say big blue chip companies such as Microsoft, but then you also see some names that, for example, Palantir just got added um, in the in the last rebalance, which I think the majority of people would agree would be a most people's sort of definition as a disruptive company, irrespective of, of fundamentals. But for us, again, you know, we're looking at how these companies perform from a six against our six fundamental factors. Um, and that's how we determine the weight. This is a criticism I've heard of the AI sector from an investment standpoint, and I'd like you to address this. This is from an economist I spoke to recently. He said that while well, the AI sector reminds him a lot of the airlines, when airlines first were introduced to America, they were a disruptor. I mean, people could now travel across the world uh, at a moment's notice. It was hugely disruptive to our industries, to our lifestyle. AI, kind of the same thing. But now over time, these airlines found it, found it difficult to compete with each other because there were so many of them, margins shrunk, and a lot of them collapsed, went bankrupt. As you know, AI 
AI companies don't know how to generate revenue. Sure, it's a disruptive technology from a business, but from a business standpoint, there's going to be a lot of them out there. And they're all going to be competing for more or less the same thing. Um, you know, not a great investment from that perspective. How would you respond to that? I think NVIDIA would disagree um, with that analysis in terms of companies not knowing how to make money. Um, so this is yeah, know, and by far and away a company that's making, you know, an unbelievable fortune from AI. And look, it's different because the, the business model is completely different. The argument with, with the airline sac sector is no different to other sectors such as railroads before that and other sort of fads that, that kind of come and go. It doesn't mean that airlines are any less important than they were. It just wasn't a great business model. And I think that that is fundamentally different to indeed the way that companies like NVIDIA make money and which clearly is highly profitable. You know, whether AI is going to last for 50, next 50 years, next 100 years, who knows? Um, but, you know, again, that's, you know, how these companies evolve. Remember that wasn't too long ago, NVIDIA made the majority of its money from, you know, video games, supplying GPUs of video game uh, sector. And, you know, that was, you know, a source of significant revenue. Now that's been eclipsed by AI. Who knows what it might be in the future? But it could also be the case that, you know, AI is the single biggest investment trend that we'll see in our lifetime, equivalent to, you know, the introduction of the internet itself. And so from that perspective, those people that are the leaders in AI makes all the sense that they would be the largest companies, therefore, in the world and the most important, you know, part of the stock market. You also have uh, AMD daily ETF, so short AMD and long 2x long AMD, AMD L and AMD S. Uh, I take it those have been, I guess, less popular per volume uh, by by measure of volume on on uh, on granite shares. Well, first of all, everything is less popular than <laughs> than Nvidia. Nvidia. All right, okay, yeah. Just to start by saying that, so NVDL is by far and away the most popular. And like I said, it's sure. one of the most traded, yeah. you know, symbols in the world right now. Um, so 2X, 2X AMD or AMDL is really popular. It's just not as popular as, as NVDL. So clearly, you know, people still very much, um, you know, like the AI story. Have people, have people told you, have investors or clients told you why they've offered speculations as to why one company is clearly outcompeting the other in this space? Not necessarily exactly that way, but, you know, clearly the, performance of the two stocks themselves is different. And again, nothing, you know, nothing compares to NVIDIA right now. And I think that's kind of reflected in where we are um, in terms of enthusiasm for it. I think with people looking at AMD, like the story of AMD, hoping that they can catch up some of the performance perhaps, um, and other sort of names, you know, linked to the AI space, such as Microsoft, even Amazon that just made a recent, you know, all time high again. So it, it, it's an interesting story, but I think the, the theme for us is by far and away the two biggest ones we've seen is AI this year and then cryptocurrency. Where we've seen a huge amount of interest in 2x Coinbase, for example, which is our CONL or CONL. You're in, a, you're in a good position to judge sentiment because Granite Shares has a lot of different ETFs in different sectors and different commodities and different asset yeah. classes. Generally speaking, based on the investors that you've dealt with, uh, what is the overall sentiment in the market right now? Are people still more risk on? Absolutely. And like I said, the two risk on places, tech stocks and cryptocurrency, um, 100% being the, being the trend of this year. And as David, as you and I have talked about many, many times on, on this show before, you know, look at something like gold and gold has performed, you know, so well really this year compared to you know, anybody's expectation, probably beginning of this year. But we just don't see that reflected in terms of flows in the same way we do as as tech and, and crypto. Yeah, well, let's segue into gold and finish off here. This is an interesting asset because on the one hand, we had rising real rates. Uh, the dollar has been strong and inflation has been trending down. These are all supposedly headwinds for gold. And yet we saw record highs, nominal highs never before seen. What do you think drove the gold price this year? It, it's really difficult to say. Um I think it's a continuation of the main fundamental trend, which is strong demand from central banks. And then I think the thing that probably took most people by surprise was the buying that came out of China, um, particularly retail investors. And, you know, when the Chinese property market um, collapsed and obviously inflation is a big problem in, in the Chinese market, um, People lost confidence, perhaps, in the number one investment, which was real estate, and then turned to 
their sort of default investment, which is gold. And of course, with stocks, you know, the, the Chinese market performed horribly. And so people weren't in the stock market or were getting out of the stock market. So gold was a massive beneficiary of a lot of buying, which perhaps, again, was unexpected from the beginning of the year. So I think that was really the swing factor um, to talk about this year. Besides what we've talked about, are there any other major investment themes that you think would impact the markets for the remainder of the year and perhaps into next year? Leaving aside the election, um, <laughs> okay, be a big a big theme, of course. But leaving aside the election, I think it's the continuation of the two the two big macro things, which is interest rates and inflation. And again, you know, based upon even even just today, looks like inflation data seems to point continually to inflation easing or coming down, you know, giving the Fed that cover that they need to make that first rate cut um, at some point either this year or beginning of next year. But the market seems to now be expecting, you know, more rate cuts, you know, again, heading into next year, but um, looking for that to start, um, if not this year, early next year. Okay, great. Thank you for the updates, Will. Uh, where can we learn more about uh, you and Granite Shares? Um, follow me online, so I'm on, on Twitter at Will Rind, um, obviously on LinkedIn, and then graniteshares.com is our website. Okay, we'll put the links down in the description below, so make sure to follow Will there. Thank you very much for your time again today. Will, we'll speak again soon. Thank you so much, David. Always a pleasure to talk to you. Thank you. Always, always a pleasure as well. Thank you for watching, and don't forget to like and subscribe.